Basically, Silverton uh, was a town in 1874 at 9,300 feet in elevation, probably one of the most remote places in the United States at that time. Um, access to the town was via a toll road, so a very thin lifeline of supplies could go through that toll road. Um, it took days to get a load of groceries to those people, or seven days to get a load of coal into Silverton. Silverton had none of those two things. They couldn't feed themselves and they, they couldn't heat their homes or run their machinery. So Durango became a town because Silverton needs, needed supplies. Uh, there was coal here and uh, basically, um, it was being mined and shipped um, by jack packers or uh, teamsters or whatever you want to call them. Um, they were shipped on the backs of animals and it took a long time and they couldn't haul very much. And if the weather was bad, the town was cut off. So the, the, the uh, need for a railroad was, was really important. Um, so in, in 1882, when the Denver and Rio Grande completed the line to Silverton from Durango, um, that seven day trip to haul coal to Silverton went to three and a half hours. And now you could haul hundreds of tons of, of coal at one trip. Whereas before you're just hauling it in sacks on the backs of animals. Same with groceries. Now you could get fresh food to those people. And, and so that was huge also. Three and a half hours versus three days. And the Rio Grande had refrigerated cars. Well, so they were big blocks of ice that kept the, fr the food fresh. But, uh, you know, it changed their way of life. The quality of life in Silverton went way up because of the railroad. And that was true all over Colorado and all over the United States, wherever railroads were were uh, brought into uh, existence. Um, it just changed people's lives dramatically. Why Durango? Well, uh, <clears throat> the main reason was because there was coal here. Uh, there was an easier way to get to Silverton. Uh, they were going to uh, survey, and they did survey, uh, the line from Creed, Colorado, up the drainage of the Rio Grande River over Cunningham Pass into Baker's Park, which is where Silverton is. No fuel though, no coal. So um, one of General Palmer's uh, buddies in the Civil War, his name was John Porter, was a coal miner. And John Porter and General Palmer were buddies and they both got rich together. Uh, Porter um, opened up some coal mines in Durango and in this area and uh, supplied the town of Silverton with, with coal. And of course, then they used the railroad to do that with. And uh, they also owned the smelter that's across the river. And so uh, they were hauling coal to Silverton, filling those cars with gold and silver concentrates and bringing them back to Durango to be processed at the smelter. And those two men got rich. Whatever happened to Animus City? Well, Animus City was here um, originally, a uh, small little farming community, nice quiet little town, and uh, they liked their way of life. They had a good relationship with uh, the indigenous peoples in the area, and uh, so they didn't want the railroad. When the railroad uh, came to them and said, we're going to change the way of life, we're going to turn this into the hub of the southwest, and and uh, great things are going to come of it. The folks in Animus City said, no, we like our life just the way it is. We like it, the quiet uh, farming and just our relationship that we have with, uh, with the landscape. And no, don't come here. It took about, you know, people say, oh, it was built in nine months. And that's just not true. Uh, the surveyors were out here. Um, in the mid 1870s, they would they would work until the snow flew in the in the fall, and that sent them to lower elevations to build elsewhere. Um, and then the the crews came in to to start blasting uh, the roadbed 
Um, it took about four or five years to uh, get everything ready to lay track. And once the track was uh, ready to go down, then it took nine months to lay track. But I want to mention that Palmer was a high-tech man. He wanted everything to be the very best. <clears throat> and so Americans didn't know how to make steel at that time. And so the steel rails for this line between Durango and Silverton came from Liverpool, England. Now wrap your head around that one. I mean, 7,500 miles, they, they shipped 45 miles of, of rail. And, and it was steel. Um, Palmer learned about steel when he was on his honeymoon in England. Uh, and he also learned about the narrow gauge when he was um, in England as well. And so two big ideas came from the British. Was he a nice guy? Very, very, uh, very well educated, um, extremely driven, and um, he was extremely successful. How important was the Durango to Silverton line in the whole scheme of things, especially in Colorado and the West? In the scheme of things, compared to other lines, maybe not so much. But it represented something that was huge. Um, it represented man's desire to conquer the mountains and, and to, to build a railroad with hand tools and carve it out from nothing and turn it into something amazing. And it, it is, and it still is today. That's why we want to tell this story over and over and over again. Any milestones back then, especially from the 1800s to about the 1920s? There are quite a few. Uh, the first one came in 1893. It was called the Silver Panic. Um, the government um, quit buying silver uh, to make coins with, and the prices of those metals fell. And what that did here was it forced some of the, a lot of the big mines to close. And it was kind of the first recession to hit the area after it was booming for about 20 years. So that was maybe milestone number one. Number two would have to be the First World War. And then the Great Depression had a huge impact on this area too. Uh, the smelter uh, didn't have a lot of uh, material to process because the mines again were hurting and, and shut down. And that, of course, affected the railroad. It affected Durango intensely because of the, um, just everything was shutting down. Take me through the, the, now we've gotten through the Great Depression, so milestones after. Yeah, um, so Second World War, big. Uh, the attitude in this country during and just after the Second World War was that the U.S. had become a world power and that Victorian times were architecture, clothing, you know, just the, that whole thinking that, uh, that came about uh, building all of this out here was suddenly obsolete. Steam power for locomotives, you know, railroads, all of that, people were buying cars, Trains were even kind of becoming obsolete. And so um, it put a lot of this area kind of in jeopardy. Whole towns literally disappeared. Um, and, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, the thinking in America was modernization, that we're a world power, um, we're going to diesel power, we're thinking the space age. All of these things, you know, obviously the atomic bomb, you know, we're in the atomic age. Um, that made um, this place had to rethink its, itself. Uh, in other words, from being known as the smelter city, which Durango was, um, they started thinking about tourism. And, and how, you know, the, the area is so beautiful. That's our, that's our greatest resource now is to have people vacation and come here um, to see the mountains and to see Mesa Verde and to ride the train. Uh, and so going from a mining and a supply town to a tourist town, that, that transitioned right after the Second World War.
And Hollywood was the catalyst that, that made that happen. Uh, folks would go to the theaters and watch movies and westerns were really popular. And, and a lot of those westerns were filmed here in this area. It was perfect because you've got the desert just a couple hours away, canyon lands, um, you've got the mountains. Uh, one of the few steam railroads left in America were still operating out of Durango. And Durango was a Wild West town. And so was Silverton. And so it was perfect for, for filmmakers to come out here and make these movies. And, and some of our biggest stars uh, that came from the 1940s and 50s came from these movies. Uh, and, and so, I mean, Marilyn Monroe's one of her first pictures, um, uh, Jimmy Stewart, you know, what an what a amazing uh, star he was. Um, they, these, these guys uh, were all in these movies. And any specific stories about any particular movies? Well, <clears throat> I think probably one of the more magnificent uh, scenes in a in, one, in the movies that they filmed here was in the movie Rio Grande. They took two steam engines, live steam engines. They did, these were not models in a, in a studio. They took two actual steam engines, loaded them up with heavy explosives, and ran them into each other in a head-on collision at Tall Timber and, and exploded them. And, and the steam engines did not blow up. And which is amazing. Uh, one of those engines, even after that horrific collision, um, returned to service, and the other one was permanently retired after that. But uh, you know they don't do that sort of thing today, <laughs> and 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 obviously they got one take. Um, they they did that in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid too. They blew up a a railroad car, and they didn't mean to. Uh, the, what happened? Well, it was, they were supposed to rob a, uh, a car loaded with, with the, the payroll, so it had a lot of money on it. And uh, anyway, uh, these guys go up to rob the, the train, and um, they're going to dynamite the door, blow the door off the car, and instead they blew up the whole car. And that was actually an accident, uh, not intended in the movie. And then, you know, here's Robert Redford and Paul Newman um, ad-libbing, going outside the, the script and, you know, hey, do you think you used enough dynamite there, Butch? That wasn't even in the script, but they kept it in the movie because it was so funny. And um, anyway, uh, things like that, that, you know, those are things that you just don't see today when they make movies anymore. I was talking to Al Harper just two days ago, and uh, I don't know how it came up, but when I was a younger person, uh, before I worked here, um, I wanted to be part of something that made a difference, that something that was important. I just wanted to be part of that. And um, I, that prayer was definitely answered when I got a job here, because this place makes a difference. It uh, makes m millions of memories for people. Uh, they come out here, they ride the train. They come out as kids and ri ride the train with their parents, and then they come back. Those kids come back and ride it again with their, with their children. That's been going on a long time. Um, we, we, if you work somewhere where you make memories for people and they carry those memories with them their whole life, that's, that's huge. Um, people that work in offices and cubicles, they can't say that. And, and um, when you see how happy it makes people to, when they see that, hear that whistle in the morning and that engine coming out to hook onto a train and how excited they are, and these people are from all over the world, then you realize what you do for a living. And it's big. So yeah, it makes you feel really good, even though most of the time it's just hard work. And uh, when you leave here at the end of the day, you're tired and you need a shower and, you know, it's, it's, it's both. It's hard work and it's very rewarding.